Hello everyone, I'm Claire Pollard and welcome to Claire's Poetry Circle. Every week this autumn I'm going to be putting up a free mini workshop for beginners on a different aspect of poetry and setting a poetry exercise. You can join at any time and um, do tell your friends or your relations or if you can think of anyone else who'd like to try it to learn a new skill during this um, rather long glum uh, period of lockdown and distancing. And the videos do stay up, so um, you can also do the course in your own time. But it's fun if we share poems week by week, I think, in the YouTube comments or with the hashtag Claire's Poetry Circle. Um, OK, so it's Halloween this week. I love Halloween. Uh, it's my birthday this week, actually, and I usually have a Halloween party where the kids dress as zombies and make egg mayonnaise eyeballs and bob apples. Um, and after they're in bed, the grown-ups uh, usually drink by the bonfire and I get out my tarot cards, maybe my Ouija board, um, but not this year, sadly, and no trick-or-treating either. So uh, I thought I'd start instead, though, by reading my favourite spooky poem, This Living Hand. It's by the romantic poet John Keats, who died in 1821, aged just 25. This Living Hand. This living hand, now warm and capable of earnest grasping wood, if it were cold and in the icy silence of the tomb, so haunt thy days and chill thy dreaming nights that thou would wish thine own heart dry of blood so in my veins red life might stream again and thou be conscience calmed. See, here it is. I hold it towards you. Shudder. What an amazing poem. It's a love poem, but it's also a kind of curse. It celebrates the living moment holding the beloved's hand in yours, but to the reader, the hand's already glaringly absent, a ghostly presence. Uh, what I love about that is it draws attention to the fact all poetry is a kind of haunting. It conjures those who are gone. It reanimates the poet or something that sounds like the poet, but isn't quite. Okay, and I've creeped you out. I thought this week we'd talk a bit about metaphor and simile. So metaphor and simile are basically when you compare one thing to another thing. A metaphor is imagery that is, I myself am hell, that's Robert Lowell famously. Simile is an image that is like or as if, I feel like hell, I feel as if I am in hell. So the simile draws attention to the fact you're making a comparison. The metaphor is a stronger formulation, some poets don't even use similes, but it can sound a bit over the top in certain contexts. I am on fire makes a more urgent claim of retention than I feel like I'm on fire. So anyway, let's just test you with some classic examples. Um, say them aloud. Which of these do you think is a metaphor and which do you think is a simile? My love is like a red, red rose, Robert Burns. It's a simile. And I am the arrow, Sylvia Plath. It's a metaphor, a stronger formulation. Um, I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. The wonderful Maya Angelou. It's a simile. It's important there, isn't it, that it is a simile. Uh, if she had gold mines, she'd be wealthy and privileged, which is not really the point of the poem. Um, the point is she's as proud as those who do. Uh, the making of the comparison is the point. The shooting stars in your black hair. Elizabeth Bishop. That's a metaphor, a beautiful one. And that metaphor makes it much more intense and romantic. Things are melting into each other. It's as though there really are stars in the lover's hair. Okay then, I think you've got it. Now metaphor and simile are absolutely central to my poetic process. So for me, a poem often begins when I think, oh, that thing is like that other thing. Um, in my poem, The Heavy Petting Zoo, which I from my first book I wrote when I was a teenager, I, you can probably guess, compare a teenage party to a petting zoo. And that's the starting point. And my poems often kind of work like that by making a connection. So let's have a go at you making some metaphors and similes. As Halloween beckons, let's think of a classic Halloween image, the full moon. Think of the shape, round, or I mean, you could do a, a part moon if you can think of a good image for a kind of slither of moon. Think of the colour, um, it's yellow here, gold, we could say silver, grey, white. Think of the texture of the moon. 
What is the moon like? I want you to write down um, six things, six things to compare the moon to. Pause your screens and write them down. The moon is like, and write down six things. Okay, we'll come back. Now, children are actually very, very good at this. Adults often fall into kind of accepted or familiar formulations, into cliches or stock phrases. Our heads run along familiar grooves. Um, we might say the moon's like cheese, for example. But cheese isn't a good simile because it might have been once, but we're no longer a society that has just one kind of cheese in the supermarket, are we? Is it blue cheese? Is it brie? Is it Emmental? What sort of cheese is it? Um, one of the things we want images to do is make us see something vividly, make us really see it. OK, so we need precision for that. Hopefully, though, you surprised yourself. You didn't just write down cliches. Um, you stretched yourself a bit. Images are a great way of showing our originality. They're a great way of showing that you have a fresh way of looking at things. Nobody else in the world looks at things the same way you do, makes exactly the same connections you do. We all bring different histories, different cultures, different reading, thinking, passions, different brains um, to our poems when we, when we look at things. And that's what makes it interesting. I, I, I don't want to read a poem about a daffodil that is like a thousand other poems I've read about daffodils. Um, I want to read a poem about a daffodil that makes me see it anew. If I ask everyone to describe um, a dark grey wall without using metaphor or simile, you'd probably all say the similar things. It's flat, it's dark grey. But if I asked you to only use metaphor or simile, you, you'd each think of something different. You'd say the wall is the colour of, you know, concrete, storm cloud, a knife, my great granny's hair, a pigeon, a wet whippet, you know. Um, and that brings us to another reason metaphor and simile is so useful to poets. Because obviously in a poem, we've said every word counts. Every word should be working hard to be there. And metaphors and similes do a kind of double work. They make us see very precisely and vividly, which we've already said, but they can also carry extra information. For example, about the world the poem is set in or the speaker's mood. If a poem begins tonight, the moon is a disco globe. That's a fresh description. But we might also assume the poem is contemporary, not set in ancient Rome. We might assume the speaker's going on a night out. Maybe they're feeling upbeat. The night's full of possibility. If the poem begins... Tonight the moon is a painkiller. Well, that's a very different vibe. When I was a teenager, um, I wrote a poem I thankfully never published, which began, um, the moon is a bowl full of my pale sick. Hmm. Um, a slip of coffee, hopefully you're on having a coffee too. I drink a lot of coffee. Um, so, as a final note, I've already um, said things to avoid in metaphor and simile is cliche. Achilles heel, swan song, formulations like that particularly. Um, but just another thing I want to set a little warning bell for is mixed metaphors. If metaphors are there to make us see things very clearly, um, then if you muddle up more than one imagery, it soon gets a bit yucky and it kind of muddies the water and makes it hard for us to see. So um, Tom Wolfe in Bonfro Vanities has a line, all at once he was alone in this noisy hive with no place to roost. Um, it's kind of madness. You can't be alone in a hive. Um, you, don't have a, you don't roost in a hive. He's mixing together all these different images. So you're making the picture unclear and we need a, a vivid picture. So try and avoid mixed metaphors. OK, I think that's everything. Time for our exercise. As it's Halloween and we've spoken about words having the power to conjure and call forth, um, I'd like you to write a poem that's a spell and the title can be a spell for and think about something you genuinely want. Um, let's try and use the power of words to conjure it closer. A spell for a family Christmas, a spell against loneliness, a spell for spring, um, a spell for healing. And I want you to think of the ingredients you're going to stir into this spell. And every ingredient you add to the poem will be an image. So if my poem was a spell for spring, I could, it could begin, I stir in a bluebell bulb, a twist of lamb's wool, um, a square of cloth, the colour of a May sky. Well, I add in these things. Each image should be 
each, each ingredient should be a nice clear image. And you can use metaphors and similes if you like, but it's not essential. Um, what's essential is you, um, you, use, you use your ingredients, these images, to conjure for us this thing you want to happen, to almost make it present. Okay, I'm really looking forward to your magical poems. Um, do post them up on Instagram or Twitter at hashtag Claire's Poetry Circle, or you can at me, I'm at Poet Claire, or you can post your poems in the YouTube comments and um, I'll try and read them all. And uh, I think that's everything. Happy Halloween, poets. See you next week.